The following presentation was recorded by View Digital Media at the inaugural Southeast Linux Fest in Clemson, South Carolina on June 13, 2009. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org. Um, okay, so I didn't bring slides because I've been told the PowerPoint rots your brain. So can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, I'll be flailing around a lot. If anyone can't hear me, just yell what or something like that, and we'll go from there. Um, I'm a terrible public speaker. Uh, I should probably say that right from the start. Um, Jerry Seinfeld was saying a few years ago that uh, statistics show that when you ask people what their biggest fears are, public speaking ranks above death, um, which means that you'd rather be the guy in the box than the one speaking in front of it. Um, so that being said, I noticed that the other two sessions here are the Ubuntu kernel, which generally just works, so no one needs to think about it, and Networking 101, which nobody wants to think about, so you're stuck with me for the hour. Um, okay, so my name's Ryan Gordon. Um, uh, for a living, I port video games to Linux and Mac OS and your toaster and things that video games were never meant to be on, and, you know, that's what I do for a living. Uh, I've worked for companies you might have heard of. If you've played a game in the last, oh, 10 years or so, you've probably either played something I've ported if it was on Linux, or you've played something I worked on in some form. Um, uh, so I don't want to talk too much about myself. I'm boring. But what I have to talk about is very interesting. So, um, OK, who in here has played a game on Linux before? All right, wow. <laughs> I'm not talking about like X-Bill and stuff. I'm talking about like big commercial stuff, the things they tell you that Linux wasn't meant for. All right, still a lot of you, and thank you. I appreciate your business. Um, okay, so gaming in Linux has changed quite a bit. If you've, if you've heard this talk five years ago, ten years ago, it changes every week, and new developments come up, and there's new successes and defeats, and uh, it's an ongoing soap opera. So I'm going to go through this, and I have this talk broken into three sections. I have it called What We Did, uh, What to Use, and What to Do. I'll let you figure out which part's which, but... Um, First, a little bit of history. This really all started, there have been games like Xbill and NetHack and, you know, many variations on both of those. But uh, the, the first time that people looked at Linux as a possibly, like a serious gaming platform and not just a, you know, a, a place where you get a Telnet session or a place where you run a mainframe server and stuff like that. The first time people looked at this said, I could sit down at a desktop and play a video game on my Linux box without rebooting, heaven forbid, into Windows 95, was a game called Doom. Who's played Doom? If you haven't played Doom, you're too young. You have to leave. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, there's a company called id Software. They made a game called Doom. If you've never played it, it's a, it was the first 3D kind of, like, serious 3D type of game, and you saw nothing but what your character was seeing in the barrel of his gun, and you shot demons and ran around, and it had a good sense of humor and stuff like that. Um, they released id Software, the company that did Doom, did a, released a closed-source binary for Linux at one point, uh, back when no one had ever thought of doing something like this. And the README that came with it was very instructive. It was written by a guy named Dave Taylor, the Linux version's README was. And among other information in this little tiny file was, this game does not generate revenue for us on Linux. I only did this because it gives me a woody. <laughs> That's a quote. I didn't make that up. Um, but it started a small fire, which has been growing and growing, and we've been throwing gasoline on it where we could. From there, a couple other games showed up, and then notably in the late 90s and the early 2000s, there was a company called Loki Software, Loki Games, um, who had the crazy idea of, why don't we go out and become a Linux game publisher? Why don't we go out there and buy the rights to games that are popular right now package them up as a full Linux version. You go out to a store, heaven forbid you go to like Best Buy or Media Play or whatever you have in the Southeast, and buy a copy of Quake 3 on the shelf and put the disk in your drive and there's a Linux version on there. And it says, oh yeah, here's a shell script to install it. And how exciting. No one had ever thought to do this. And it didn't work too well. They went out of business um, for lots of reasons that had nothing to do with whether you could actually sell Linux games or not. But at one point in their history, in their short history, they're only around for, say, two years, two and a half years total, they did a couple of things that were very noteworthy. One, you could go into a Best Buy or a Media Play or a Fry's or whatever, uh, a Walmart for crying out loud, and say, there's a video game section, because there's always a video game section at any big box store. And they'll be like, here's our hottest games. These are the games we want to put 
on the shelf where your eyeballs will see them, where the impulse buy says, that looks really cool. I need to get a copy of that. And if you looked at it, any, at any given time, they keep track of top 10 games. You know, what are the hottest selling games on Windows? And we're looking, we're going, one, two, three, four, five. There's about eight, nine, sometimes seven. Somewhere high near that number 10 of the top 10 games were running on Linux as native versions. You could go out and buy or download or whatnot a Linux version of the best selling games of the time. Uh, it was a massive achievement um, that inv involved a massive amount of capital that Loki just simply didn't have. Um, but there is a better way. We'll get to that. Um, Loki did one other thing that was really, really smart, and they came in and recognized that the tools they needed did not exist. Little things like, little things you take for granted, for example, if, say, you are a Ubuntu user or a Red Hat user, because I see your fedora, not to call you out, sir. Um, can I get a breakdown here? Like, um, who runs Fedora? Who's a Ubuntu person? Gentoo? Slackware? There's always one. I saw you back there. <laughs> He's got the t-shirt and everything. Um, thank you. I just like to take a poll there. Um, I don't even remember what I was saying. Um, but we, we noticed that if you're, for example, a Ubuntu user, you just use apt-get. And if you're a Fedora user, you just use yum. And if you're Slackware, you just spend a lot of time. <laughs> I used to be a Slackware user. I can say that. Um, they... These things you take for granted, you could just install software. But when you were selling software, it came on a disk. It's like, well, what do you do to make sure it's going to work on Red Hat and Ubuntu and Slackware and stuff? So Loki, uh, Loki went out there and built their own installer. It was called Loki Setup. Uh, and it lasted many, many years. We're just replacing it now for cross-distribution software installation with something called Mojo Setup. Um, they built something called SDL, which we'll get to later, which has helped them get bits onto the screen. It helped them get bits to the, video car uh, the audio card. Um, they built uh, motion video decoding libraries for MPEG video, which was hot at the time. It's not anymore, but hey, that was 10 years ago. Um, they, they built all these tools for things that they would need that didn't exist. And I think more important than the games, because games come and go. I mean, Quake 3 is still cool in a certain way, but you know, your friends are not going to get around and be like, what are you playing tonight? Left 4 Dead, man, it's going to be awesome. What are you playing? Quake 3 came out in 1997. Want to play? <laughs> no, um, but we'll get to Quake 3 later, too. Um, but um, th th um, Loki built all this stuff they needed for that, and the games were great at the time, and like all markets, it has moved on. These games have become more obsolete beyond you know, the archaeologists and the aficionados. Uh, but the tools, the, the, the mentality of get in there and build what you need and don't whine if it's not there, just roll up your sleeves and build it yourself, that has been incredibly valuable, and you see it all over the Linux community. You see it in the distros, you see it in the kernel. You see, there's very little time where people whine about stuff not being there. They just sit down and do it and you know, become little spots of light in the wilderness, the heroes of open source and stuff. Um, Loki did that same thing. All their tools they built, they, obviously they couldn't open source the games because they didn't own the intellectual property on them, so it goes. But all of their tools they open sourced. And Loki went under, but Loki's tools lived on. And for another decade, they've served us really well. Um, and we're going to get to some of those later. Um, now today, all those things have gone. There were a couple other ones. I don't mean to minimize other ones besides Loki. Loki was just one of those big, really spectacular failures that people talk about later. <laughs> But there were others. There was Hyperion, who did a game called Shogo and uh, Giants, and ported Linux versions of it, and eventually decided the Linux market wasn't worth their time, so they started doing Amiga versions of their games. This is not a joke. <laughs> um, I didn't even know there was an Amiga. <laughs> um, uh, there, there's, a game, there's a company called Linux Game Publishing. They're still around today. They don't do many games at once. They're, they're very risk adverse. They wait till they can get a good game cheap that they can sell for a long time. This is not a bad strategy. We wouldn't have a housing crisis if people thought this way, but, um, but they're not the biggest, baddest thing out there. You know? But they are still around. They're still selling games. And if you go to LinuxGamePublishing.com, they would love to take your money. Uh, they will ship today. Um, so, uh, so there are still commercial interests around in that regard, but we found that commercial interest for Linux games still exists. It just exists in a different form. It's no longer an individual publishing entity. It's no longer a Loki Games, or it's no longer a Linux game publishing or whatnot that wants to sell you a boxed Linux version. In this day and age, it costs too much to put something in a, Lin a Linux version in a box, because really you're paying to ship a whole bunch of cardboard and oxygen across the country in a big gaming box and a little piece of plastic as a DVD. And it, 
you have to bribe, literally bribe places like Best Buy to get on their shelves and stuff. It's just not worth the money to get in there. However, we have a solution to that. It's called the Internet. We're very quickly, whether it's games or otherwise, getting to the point where you're not going to pay for a physical CD anymore. And when you do, it's going to be a novelty. It's going to be like, happy birthday, I had to get you something physical. You know, um, <laughs> games again. But, um, but we have... Uh, uh, but we're getting to the point where you're just going to download games. And then that massive amount of initial capital you need just to get in the door, whew, gone. Don't need it anymore. Um, and you're starting to see things like that. And we'll talk about that a little later on, too. Um, finally, there's uh, so you have your commercial interests, and then you have the open source interests of video games. And some of you might be playing some of these games and not realize it. For example, I mentioned Quake 3 before. Quake 3 is open source. It is literally under the GNU general public license. You can get Quake 3 under the GPL now. Um, id Software, remember the Woody guys? Um, they have a long history of doing this. They put out that Linux version of Doom. Didn't make them any money, but you know they're, they're hardcore tech people. They lo it, it would offend their techie soul not to play around with that kind of thing. So. They did that, and then every you know four or five years after their game ships, and they're not making money off it anymore because your span in retail video game sales is about one week, two weeks, depending if it's Christmas, depending on what the competition is. You'll spend forty million dollars and four years building a game, and then you get two weeks to make your money back, and then nobody wants to talk about your game anymore, which is a really frightening place to be. But you know, there's always going to be your successes. You're still going to have your Half Life twos, and you're still going to have your Doom, uh, your uh, Quake 3s and stuff like that, where they were large commercial successes in that two-week span and whatever they can make after that. But there comes a point of diminishing returns where these games just don't make money anymore. Who's going to buy a copy of, um, I don't know, Commander Keen at this point? Does anyone remember Commander Keen? It was awesome in the time if you liked Super Mario Brothers. To give you an idea, like if you could play it on 8-bit Nintendo, that's about the era we're thinking of here. Um, Nobody's going to pay for that game anymore because it's ancient. And if they do, it's a novelty thing. And they're, I bought it on Steam, I admit. Uh, so you can... <laughs> I like Commander Keen. Sue me. Um, so you, you can sell it, but it's going to be a novelty thing. It's, you're not going to make millions of dollars off of any of these games. In fact, uh, Tim Sweeney from Epic Games used to run his company when they were making text-based games, like a NetHack clone for DOS. They were making... Uh, called ZZT. He, he still sells about three or four copies a, a year. His dad still lives at the same mailing address that his company was run out of. So, uh, you know, every couple of weeks sends out another copy of ZZT for whatever it is, five bucks. Because somebody had some novelty. Sends it to you on a floppy disk just to, you know, punish you for it. And, um, <laughs> and you know, you, you could still sell that. But, I mean, $20 a year compared to uh, Unreal Tournament 3 costs God knows how many millions to make. And the technology they license for God knows how many millions of dollars to big AAA companies every year. Who cares about $20 in that regard? Uh, so with that mentality in mind, its software said, here's the source code. And it's just not, here's the source code, but here's the source code under the GPL. Do whatever you want with it. Go nuts. In fact, there was one point where someone didn't abide by the GPL, and John Carmack, who runs the company, went directly after that guy and said, I'm going to sue you with whoever the Free Software Foundation recommends if you do not release your source code changes. Now, that guy means business. Also, if you've ever been bitch slapped by John Carmack, you feel that. Um, <laughs> Um, so, uh, so you have these games, and, and I don't mean to single out in software. Other people have done this. 3D Realms did it with Duke Nukem 3D, if that, anyone remembers that game. That game was awesome. Still is. Uh, uh, you know, other companies have done it, which are slipping my mind at the moment. But um, they've seen one, they've seen Id's example on this, but they've also seen it works. We're not going to make any money. Let's see what people can do with it. And we found that... People do interesting things. I like to split these into two groups. I call them the open source Indiana Joneses, and I call them the open source Isaac Newtons, and I'll explain why. Um, the Indiana Joneses are the ones that go into the temple and grab the diamonds and run out with the boulder chasing them behind them. You know what I'm talking about? We've all seen this movie. If you haven't seen this movie, you're also too young. Go. Um, <laughs> the new one doesn't count. Um, <laughs> but these are the people that go in there and say, okay, this game ran on 16-bit DOS. It wrote right to the video card registers. It expected you to have a Sound Blaster 16 or it wouldn't start up. And, you know, there is no hardware abstraction at all. In fact, if anyone remembers most DOS games, they'd be like, click a checkbox for the sound card you have. 
And it's like, these are the five sound cards you can use with this game because we've written directly to the registers of those five. Nothing else works. There's no concept of a device driver. It was DOS, you know? What could you do? It doesn't change the fact the source code, here, have another GPL. Can you still write to the Sound Blaster registers? Is that still going to work? No? Sorry. I mean, what are you going to do about it? So pe these Indiana Jones people have run into the temple, ripped all that crap out, gotten the thing to build with GCC, gotten it to work with modern hardware, modern operating systems, and said, here's the exact same game you played before, but it now runs on Linux. It's a native 32-bit, 64-bit, whatever bit binary. This is not running as a DOS-emulated DOS box thing. This is the real thing. And, oh, this used to talk over an IPX network. Pfft, we ripped that out. Now you can play it over the Internet. You know, things like things we never <laughs> dreamed of doing in the early 90s, you know, when these, the hot thing was Windows 3.1, for lack of a better term. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, so these Indiana Joneses come in, and they, they do something kind of heroic. They run in, and they, with the DOS boulder chasing behind them, they get these games running on Linux and the Mac and modern Windows. And, you know, you see Quake 2 ports on Palm Pilots and crazy things like that because they can. Uh, it's awesome. Now, the Isaac Newtons... Isaac is famous for lots of things, but everyone's heard that shoulder of giants quote. You know, if I've come this far, it's only because I stood on the shoulders of giants. Okay, maybe you haven't heard it. There's this guy named Isaac Newton. Um, uh, yeah, so um, that applies in the sense that there are people that will port these games. And there's other people who say, that game was cool. I liked Quake 3, but I've had this game I've always wanted to build. It's got aliens in it, and it's got... Bases that you have to storm and blotty, blotty, blotty. And they bribe their friends with pizza and, you know, wares or something like that. And they get a team together, a small team, and they'll take this game that someone else has made and make it into a new game. They've literally stood on the shoulders of giants that have made big, impressive technology. And they've taken that and said, okay, the Quake engine did a lot of interesting things, and this vision I've had for a game I've, that I always wanted to make, I can now make. And you see things have come out of it like Tremulous, which is a new version. It's, it's a first-person sh shooter multiplayer game built on top of Quake 3, but it's its own game in its own right. It's not a simple modification. It's a full game in and of itself. Or Dark Places or Nex Nexuous or uh, et cetera like that. Um, these are the Isaac Newtons, and they're out there, and they're saying, I don't want to spend five man years building the technology behind this, I just want to build a game. And they're taking this GPL source code that people are doing and building something incredible and beautiful and unexpected on top of it. Um, so that's where we are today. Um, I run a site called iculus.org. I don't know if anyone's seen it. If you haven't, that's OK. I forgive you. Um, <laughs> we, we do two things. Run, running along what I said was the best thing of Loki, we still build open source technology install our software. I mentioned Mojo set up briefly before. Libraries that help gamers do gamer type things like Physics FS, which makes file system access easier for the ways games want to do it and stuff like that. Um, other people have come to this site. It's not all game oriented, but that's the kind of the focus we've liked to keep on is that we want to build this community of people building open source stuff, ports of games, the Indiana Joneses and the Isaac Newtons and, and the Edisons and such that are building stuff that other people can build. Um, and we're kind of, we, we, we joke that we call ourselves SourceForge with Soul. Chris, you're not out there, are you? Okay, good. Uh, Chris DeBone is talking later. Ask him about SourceForge someday. He was very heavily involved in that. Um, we, we used to, uh, when I started Aculus.org, I noticed that SourceForge was out there. Who has a project on SourceForge? Who has a project that actually has done anything on SourceForge? <laughs> no hands go up. I saw it. Um, SourceForge had a big problem that there were a million projects on it, and all of them had, like, one header in CVS and nothing else, or they had a forum where they talked about how awesome their project was going to be, but as soon as we find someone that can read a book on C++, and you all know the type. You've all been involved in these projects. I've been involved in these projects. Everyone has an intellectual exercise. Um, but it, it occurred to me that that's kind of a waste of space, it, and there's nothing more frustrating than Googling for that one thing you need. That like I need something that converts Word documents to blah, blah, blah format, and you Google for Word to blah, 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 and there's a link to a SourceForge page with no damn source code. <laughs> I hate that. So, uh, with Aculus.org, I wanted to make a space kind of like SourceForge. You get your revision control and your email and your shell account and all that stuff on my beautiful rack server somewhere in the heart of Chicago. And uh, basically, you get no limitations. Anything we can make work for you, we will do for you. If you need a new, for it, we used to have a CVS server, now we have Subversion, Git, Mercurial, 
you know, people have asked for these things, we add them, bug tracking, blah, blah, blah. We want to make the developer experience good because the primary key of Iculus.org is that we are elitist jerks. We send so many people away. It used to be about half of the people that talked to me I would send away. They'd be like, yo, man, I got this idea. It's going to be more awesome than Doom 3, and it's going to have per pixel shader lighting and uh, 50 levels and blah, blah, blah. And it's like one, it's like a 13-year-old kid, you know, in junior high. You know the type. You've all been that 13-year-old kid. Some of you are still that 13-year-old kid. <laughs> Read a book on C, kid. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, so uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with being that 13-year-old kid. I, you know, I, I always make that joke in this speech, and it's rude of me. I shouldn't do it, because those are the next generation Linus Torvalds. They all started that way. In fact, if you look at Linus Torvalds' first email about Linux, it's kind of goofy, you know? <laughs> Back me up on this. You know I'm right. So you shouldn't discourage those people. I don't mean to make fun of you. If you're one of those 13-year-olds, just seriously, write two headers before you email me. But um, So we send a lot of people away, and we found that, uh, and, and we're honest, we don't, we're not rude. I hope, but we, we don't, we, we'll tell people we don't think that project's going to work or come back to us in a while when you've worked on it and then we'll nurture you. We'll be your open source incubator. But too many of the, even with incubation, a lot of these projects just die right on the vine before they even sprout. I don't know if that was a mixed metaphor, but um, the, the, even, even carefully weeding people out and saying, I don't think that will work, or you need to come back later, or something like that, we still had about a 50% failure rate. So when I'm individually weeding people by hand, imagine what the failure rate must be on SourceForge. So um, not to compare, I'm just saying. Uh, so that's where we are today. This is not what I came to talk to you about. I just want to give you an overview for those that have never played a game. Um, has anyone here never played a video game? See, no one ever raises their hands for this, and there's a reason for that. Most of you, if I was like, who out there has all 58 achievements and Left 4 Dead unlocked? No one would raise their hand, because even the hardcore gamers aren't that hardcore. Uh, and the Lighthouse is a very hard level, if you haven't played it. Uh, it's, I'm never going to get that achievement. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> But, you know, there, there is this, a mentality of hardcore gamers. You know the types, the ones that go to the 10,000-person LAN games and, you know, QuakeCon and stuff like that. And it's just they don't shower for days and, you know, you know the type. We've all seen them and we're all scared of them. Um, <laughs> if, if they had any muscle tone at all, they might mug you. You don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, but <laughs> uh, but th those are not... People think about those, the, the hardcore gamers and they go, I'm not like that. I'm different than those people. I'm not a gamer. Well, you might not be a hardcore gamer, and frankly, good for you if you're not. But, and you might even like first-person shooters and not be a hardcore gamer. You might just like to sit down with your friends and play Halo on the Xbox every now and then. More power to you. It's, the, the problem is we've gotten to this point where people say they're either a gamer or they're not, and not a single one of you raised your hand. Because playing Solitaire is gaming, playing x is gaming, you know, sometimes just deleting all the spam in your inbox is kind of like a game. But, <laughs> but without going that far, everyone has a game they like to play. And this is only accelerated in recent years, because there's lots of people that would say, oh, I don't play video games, but I play Peggle all the time. Oh, okay, Peggle's not a video game, right? Or more to the point, I don't play video games, but I love The Sims. Anyone play The Sims? Not really a video game, but it's a video game. Um, everyone is a gamer, and it's remarkable to me because I bring props everywhere I go. I find them out in the hallways. This is up, did anyone see this up on the, uh, the board out there? I don't know if you can see that on the camera, I'm sorry. It's, a, it's, a, it's an Apple advertisement. It says, buy a Mac for college and get a free iPod Touch. It's a great return on your investment. Hmm. I, it is. I like Mac OS. I mean, I think that when you're willing to spend money for something, I think you should probably buy the Lexus and not the, you know, Yugo. But, um, <laughs> but it's remarkable to me um, that what marketing will do for you, because how much do you pay for a Linux distribution? Does even, anyone even pay for the disk anymore? Why can't we market that? Why is this hanging up out there and we're not hanging out, you know, you're a gamer, you're, you can play games for free on Linux, you know, uh, you are, you need a word processor. We have one that doesn't suck for free. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I... You know, of all the ridiculous things I said, I didn't think that would be the joke. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so it, it's, it's baffling to me, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit further in my what to do section. Um, 
But I want to move on from this. We'll talk about the Apple ads some more, but um, I was telling you this for a reason. Now I forget. Oh, yes, we're all gamers. So, um, you know, it, it's remarkable to me that we, everyone in this room can identify themselves as someone that likes to play video games and not, doesn't think of it as some childish thing. It doesn't have to be a, an obsession. It can be a nice pastime, but no one thinks of it as an embarrassment. Like, oh, yeah, you know, I, there's just one time it was the alley behind 7-Eleven. He had a copy of, uh, of uh, Bejeweled 2, and you know how it goes. <laughs> Bejeweled's a gateway drug, by the way. In case you, <laughs> if you didn't know, now you know. Um, so I want to talk to you, before I get off on too much of a tangent here, I want to talk to you about some of the technology that's out there for gaming on Linux. Because um, I think there probably are people in every audience I've talked to that thinks that Linux is still something for secure shell sessions to some remote server. And it's definitely that, and I use it for that every day, and I love it for that. But there's more to it than that. And not just like, well, it kind of flakily works on the, the fringes. This is today. You can go home and do this right now. Um, 3D acceleration. You can put two video, two NVIDIA video cards in your machine and have them work in parallel, and the drivers are awesome. I hate to say that about a closed source driver, but their driver is awesome. Anything you can do on Windows with OpenGL with 3D acceleration, you can do on Linux. There are no limitations if you happen to use the NVIDIA drivers. And other people are catching up, but it is, it's no longer a question of can I do that on Linux at all. Audio, if you want a 3D audio API, you can do it. If you just want to dump bits to the sound card so it makes some beeps and bloops, you can do it. Something you can do on Windows, you can also do on Linux. There is no limitation there. Input, if you want joysticks, if you want keyboards, if you want mouse, if you want multiple mice, if you want to have all your friends plug in a mouse and play an eight-person game, you can do it on Linux. You are not limited to Windows on that regard. Uh, scripting languages, actually, you beat Windows on that. So. Um, a web browser, if you want to be able to, on Windows, if you're like, well, I just needed an HTML widget, just put Internet Explorer in there and pray for the best. That used to be a big limitation on Linux. You always had Gecko, but it was complicated to embed and stuff like that. Now we have WebKit, which is KHTML for those that are purists about it. It's now as easy on Linux as it's doing on Windows. In fact, I would argue it's better on Linux than it is on Windows. And anyone that's ever had to write a web page that works in Internet Explorer knows what I'm talking about. Um, all sorts of technology, it used to be, well, we can get this far, but there's always these few things we have to work around that you could do on Windows that you couldn't do on, on Linux, but those things are long gone. The kernel developers have done a good job, the distribution people have done a good job, the low level, the high level, everyone's done a good job. You have no limitations. Now, things will work differently on Linux because there's different mentalities about how things should be done, what user interfaces should look like, blah, blah, blah. But there is no technical barrier. There's no obstacle that you can't climb. Um, so I want to talk very briefly about some things you should be using if you're writing games, or really, if, for the most part, if you're writing any kind of multimedia software, or maybe any kind of software at all. Um, first off, I mentioned SDL before, Simple Direct Media la Layer. Uh, HTTP, lib, SDL, I L I B. SDL, Simple Direct Media Layer, .org. Um, Simple Direct Media Layer is your kitchen sink. It's the answer to DirectX. It's everything that people always said about Windows. Nah, 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 nah. We can talk right to the video cards, and you know the, the video access is fast, and input is fast. SDL has solved that, and it's solved it in an incredibly useful way. In that, when Loki first wrote this, we didn't know what people were going to use for video. There were still people using FBCon to run two-dimensional games. And it worked great. You know, you didn't need an X server. And if you had not enough memory, you could still run a 2D, a full-fledged, impressive, commercial-level 2D game on the frame buffer console in, in Linux. Uh, but most people couldn't use the frame buffer console because they had an X server running. Uh, because despite its flaws, the X server does give you a lot of benefits. So, um, so there was an open question of what people would use as their main environment. Now, SDL solved that problem by not just wrapping this stuff in abstraction, where instead of saying, OK, do I want to talk to FBCon, or do I want to talk to this, or do I want to talk to X server, or do I want to talk to AALib? We'll talk about that some other day. But um, AALib is crazy, and you should check it out if you haven't. Um, Instead of doing that, it wraps in a nice abstraction. You just say, SDL set video mode. Pfft, there, you have a video display. Write pixels into it. Go forth and prosper. Um, but it also was smart enough to say, OK, let's look at the system at runtime. You installed this game 
from a disk or from a download or whatnot like that. We don't know ahead of time what your system is going to look like. We don't know what packages you've installed. We don't know what hardware works. We don't know anything. And if we know now, next time we run it after you reboot and you've ripped out some piece of hardware or you've changed a BIOS setting, we won't know again. So SDL is very good at runtime saying, what does this person have of this combination of hardware and APIs that are available and shared libraries on the system? What should we be doing? And it makes the best decision for you, which I know when people make decisions for you, it's terrible terrifying, but it works really well. And this has proved good for the video thing, which I mentioned. Uh, pretty much everyone's using an X server at this point. I think that's pretty much one out, unless you're working on an embedded device. Um, and even there sometimes is the one laptop per children people are proving, or were proving. I don't know. Um, what we found now is that Linux has kind of an identity problem in audio APIs. The beautiful thing about writing to the audio device is that there's so many ways to do it. And none of them work exactly the same way. So SDL is made so you just say, give me an audio, give me access to the sound card. And it'll figure out how to get there, whether it's ALSA or OSS, or you want to go through Pulse Audio or whatever like that. It's worked really well. If you're doing any kind of multimedia stuff, if you have any kind of multimedia stuff on your system, you probably have a copy of LibSDL already installed. Obviously, it comes in all the distribution repositories. You probably already have it. You can start writing to it today. It also has the luxury of being one of the easiest APIs you will ever use. Um, getting stuff onto the screen, if you were to do it, just to get like a window on the screen. If you were to do it in Direct Draw, Direct 3D, one of the Microsoft APIs, it's about 100 lines of code just to get that thing on the screen. Nobody knows what it does. They just cut and paste it from the documentation. <laughs> We've discovered there are bugs in that documentation, too, uh, so you might run into them. SDL, one line, to get, one line of code, one function call, four parameters to get a window on the screen. 640, 480, true color, go. Uh, to draw stuff to the screen, you put some pixels in there or use OpenGL, whatever you like, and then you call one function, SDL flip, boop, goes to the screen. You're done. That's all there is. And there's SDL quit when you want to be done with it. Um, it's literally on, and it runs on every platform. So chances are if you wrote to SDL, you probably also run on Linux, Mac OS, Windows, Win64, BIOS, yes, BIOS, Amiga, yes, Amiga, uh, embedded stuff you've never heard of, the iPhone, the Palm Pilot, the Nintendo DS, the Sony PSP, the Sega Dreamcast. We have a PlayStation 3 port going for Google Summer of Code. Chances are you're going to change exactly zero lines of that code that you wrote to make it work on a new platform. If your code will compile and you wrote to SDL, chances are your stuff's just going to work, which is awesome. Um, I mentioned WebKit briefly. I'm running behind schedule, so I'm just going to say WebKit is awesome. KHTML, whatever you want to call it. Lots and lots of people have put a lot of money into beating Internet Explorer, and congratulations, they have. If you don't know it, you're probably using it. Uh, everything except for Firefox is probably using WebKit at this point, whether it's the KDE's browser. Galleon? I forget the name of it. Conqueror, sorry. Galleon something else entirely. If you're using Safari on Windows or Mac OS, if you're using Google Chrome, Chris, are you here? Seriously. Go to Chris to bonus talk afterwards. He's gonna, probably going to talk about Chromium, um, the open source version of Google Chrome, which uses WebKit. Um, it's easy to embed. It's easy to target it at a new system. For example, if you really, really don't like the GTK target, you can point it at KDE, which is kind of a full circle sort of thing. If you want it on your Nokia phone, which it's already there, then they could make a user interface for it and more than just the you know handle what the scroll bar should look like and stuff. It's a good piece of software. If you need to embed HTML in your program, you need to use it. We'll get to that later, too. Um, OpenGL. Anytime you want to get stuff to the hardware nowadays, you should be using OpenGL. GL stands for graphics library. It's not important. The only thing you need to know is that this is the fastest way on X11 or Windows or Mac OS or anything to get things rendered onto the screen. Uh, it abstracts away all the details of that really cool ATI card you have or that really cool NVIDIA card. And if you need frames per second or you need really cool looking stuff, you pretty much have to use OpenGL to get performance nowadays. It's fully supported on Linux. Use it. Love it. Be part of it. Um, Scripting. No one should be writing a game nowadays in C or C++. I mean, you can. You can write the low-level stuff in it if you want to, you know, make sure that, like, the main loop runs quickly or something. But as quickly as you can, you should be getting out of native code and into a scripting language. You can pick your favorite. Chances are, if there's a good scripting language, it started on Linux. In fact, it's usually just the people from Windows lagging along eventually will get it. But 
chances are if it runs and runs well, it was written by someone who's a Linux user. Um, now you can pick your favorite. For gaming, I love Lua. That's my favorite scripting language right now. Um, but there's other ones out there such as, you know, if you want to embed Perl, you can do it. If you want to embed Ruby, you can do it. If you want to embed Python into your game, you can do it. In fact, there's a, a package called Pygame. Has anyone ever used Pygame? Oh, right, the Pygame people are in the house. Um, Pygame basically gives you an entire gaming environment, not just low-level stuff like put a sprite on the screen or whatnot. It's, an, it's, the, it's the whole package, and you write your entire game in Python. You don't write any C code. Um, I'm too afraid of white space to use that, but it's available, and I highly recommend it for people that like Python. Um, there's no reason not to be using a scripting language as much as possible. It makes your life easier. Uh, revision control. Everyone should be using it. Um, there's no excuse to be using CVS anymore. If you're still using it, it's time to switch. If you work at a place that won't switch, it's time to quit. Um, <laughs> you all have a place like that. You all know that place. That's using Visual Surf Safe or something like that. Um, I like Mercurial. To each their own, Subversion's very good, and it's more than most people need. Uh, Git is very good. I you thought Git was, a couple weeks ago, I thought Git was going to be the winner. I'm not so sure anymore. It might be Mercurial. So, uh, you know, if you have your particular site on the Holy War, you can just go to the left or right of the auditorium, and we'll go from there. Uh, finally, the, the last technology I want to mention very briefly today is SQL Lite. You shouldn't be writing config files anymore. You just absolutely shouldn't. SQL Lite solves all your problems. I, I don't know if Richard's in the room anywhere, but he's giving a talk later today, too. Uh, go see Richard Hipp's session on SQL Lite. It will change your world. It's that good. You don't have to worry about config files. You don't have to worry about uh, storing data. It's basically an SQL database that sits in one file, and it's really, really well engineered. And if you want to embed it in your program, it's one C file. You're a fool not to use it. Um, it's very good. Uh, OK, so moving on, because I'm running behind here. Last section, what to do. I want to talk a little bit about promotion today, which is why I brought the Apple poster, which I stole from out in the hallway. Um, the college people won't mind. They can't afford a Mac anyway. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> There are some things you could be doing. A lot of people have asked me, what can we do to make Linux a more popular platform? What can we do to evangelize and promote Linux? And the answer might be face-to-face, -face, nothing. You really, it, it's kind of at this moment in time, if I can be a pessimist, we've all lost to Windows for this round because the chance for Linux to become dominant was the disaster known as Windows Vista. And then Microsoft repackaged Vista as Windows 7 and changed about nothing in it. And now everyone's talking about how great it is. So um, the marketing campaign is over before it started. That was a mistake. Here's how this is going to work. Um, we're going to talk about things you can do. But the way that Linux is going to become popular in America is by becoming popular in the third world. Um, it's going to be Russia. It's going to be China. It's going to be Africa. It could have been one laptop per child. It's going to be something that is a small embedded system, uh, like the Shiva plug thing. If anyone's seen that cool little wall wart thing you know what I'm talking about? Those things are awesome. But it's going to be something like that, where Linux is coming into people's lives, and they don't know it in America. Like, for example, how many of you have a TiVo? How many of you have a relative that has a TiVo? How many of your relatives know that their TiVo is running Linux? Zero of them, except for this guy with the big beard. And I would expect no less from you, sir. Um, <laughs> um, in those ways, Linux will come into American homes without people knowing it, but that's an act of subterfuge. I think that's good, but I don't think that's sufficient. And I don't think that talking to somebody on the street is going to change anything, because contrary to what people say, you can't change the world one person at a time. You've got to change them groups at times, uh, countries at times even, and more so than you knocking on a door, because they're going to think you're a Jehovah's Witness and not open it. Um, you have to go to China and have China say, as a government edict, everyone's using Linux. The government is not paying for Windows anymore. And given the right government, like Hugo Chavez might just hate Microsoft enough, it'll go through and no, no sugar deal, no sweetheart deal will change that. And then once that goes, you have an entire country. I'm sure there are already countries, and I can't think of one off the top of my head. But once you start to have entire nations that are running Linux at the government level and then at the school level, because who, who had a Mac? when they were in elementary school. Now, who had a Mac after elementary school? No one, because they screwed up the marketing and Windows won. But that's how you get a generation of people. That's how you get a nation. And once you have a nation of people out there with fast internet access and an entire lifetime of building, a Linux, building Linux software and building Linux environments and working in Linux, those people are not going to tolerate 
Windows. They're not going to tolerate Mac OS. Well, they'll tolerate more than Windows, I guess. But they, um, these people eventually in their countries will have something that we want, and that's money. Uh, within the next year, we'll probably want it a lot. But, um, uh, but as these c people grow up and want to do business with America, they're going to say, where's the Linux version? We're not doing business with you if all you're going to give me is an EXE file, you know, for whatever version of Windows, Windows 12, which is better than Vista, right? <laughs> that is where it's going to happen. I don't want to be a downer and say that. They actually, this is actually a positive message. You just have to wait another 20 years. So uh, set, your, set, set your calendars. Uh, but in the meantime, that, that's how the business works. Because sooner or later, I mean, jokes about getting the free iPod, the, the $500 iPod with the $10,000 Mac. Uh, <laughs> so, so, sooner or later, people do realize that despite the marketing, free is pretty damn good. And, you know, I mean, when you have a whole generation or a whole nation or a whole organization that's saying, I'm not paying hundreds of dollars per computer because everybody's got five computers on their desk. He Some of us probably have five computers in our pockets right now. I mean, you got your cell phone, you have a netbook on your lap. I mean, there's that computer, that, that uh, camera's probably running Linux, you know, whatever, something like that. Um, so these things will happen. Don't panic. In the meantime, here's what you'll be doing. First off, mentor people. There's not enough smart American programmers. We need more of them. So if you happen to be a smart American programmer, go out and teach someone to be one. Go out to a community college and offer to teach C or whatever the, the program language of the day is. Please don't teach C to beginners. It's terrifying. Um, <laughs> I think it was like Latin. Everyone should know it really well. But you, know, you throw someone into the C pool on their first day, and they drown. So don't do that. Um, Start them with logo, something embarrassing, Visual Basic, heaven forbid. But when you, don't laugh, Visual Basic is very good if you have never programmed before. It's low, um, it's, it, the, the barrier to entry is incredibly low on it because you can throw up a message box with a little OK button and the first time you get someone to realize that for the first time in their life, their computer did what they told it to instead of whatever it wanted, it is, <laughs> it's a freeing experience. It really is. And I think a lot of you that are programmers in here, which I suspect is probably a lot of you, I don't want to stereotype or anything, but the first time you did program something, it probably wasn't in C, and it probably wasn't, heaven forbid, assembly language. It was probably something you wouldn't admit to now. It was probably GW Basic or something, Quick Basic or something like that or uh, whatnot. But, or Logo, which I love and no one else on the planet does. But... Um, it was non-threatening, and it said, my god, this is the first time ever that this has been about discovery and creation. And it's a beautiful thing, and it's an auxiliary. It, it's a drug. It really is. And the more people you can introduce to that face-to-face, one-on-one, that's the most important thing you can ever do. Even if they grow up to be Windows computer uh, programmers, hey, man, you tried your best. But, you know, <laughs> a, a Windows programmer is better than no programmer at all, in my mind, at least. So I think the more people you can mentor, the more people you can teach, the better off the world's going to be. And it's something you can do today. And it doesn't have to be, I'm going to quit my job and go work at the community college. There are always places that want you to give an hour of your time. Go to the library and say, I want to set up a class. We're going to talk for an hour every week. And you'd be surprised what you can do. You're not going to teach people even probably to the level of, like, here's what recursion is. It's not important. Don't get that far. Get far enough where you can do print, hello world, go to 10. And even that is a magical thing, the first time you see that happen. Because the next thing you do is go, what happens if I add another line in there? What if I have it print two things and then go to 10? What if I have it go to 20? What can 20 be? You know, this is magical. This is what, that's the joy of programming. And throughout our lives, this is beaten out of us as we debug another linked list that's the same thing we've written for 15 years. But at that moment in time, anything is possible. So if you can put that gift into someone's life, you should do it. You should walk out of this speech and go do it if you can do it right now. I won't be offended. No, actually, I will. Please don't leave until I'm done speaking. Um, donate code. And if you work for some place that does closed source stuff, most of us do, you should be the guy that always tries to broach that conversation about, you know, I understand we can't open source this whole thing because of intellectual property and blah, 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 and we're embarrassed and, you know, it's how it works, but... This one function, this one library here, this one little sub module, be really useful to everybody. And you know, 
if we could just get it out there, there'd be so much goodwill, and you know, you could get some PR off of that, and talk in terms that people that wear ties would, uh, instead of you know dressing like this. Uh, Talk in business terms of things of goodwill and marketing and advertising and you know uh, free labor, which anyone that's worked on an open source uh, project knows it doesn't actually work that way. But uh, but it is important to hear that as a suit, as a business person. And if you can get little pieces of code open, you'd be surprised the kind of things that you use every day as a standard part of a standard Linux distribution that were just goodwill that somebody managed to talk their boss into letting them stick out on the internet. In fact, you could argue that's how Unix started, right? <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Um, hey, AT&T could own it all right now. You don't know. Um, so donate code where you can. And if you do stuff in your free time, think about releasing it. Just stick it on a website. Put it out on a just a, a, a unmarked directory on an Apache server and be like, here's something cool I did, and then move on with your life. And someone might find it. I mean, it might not be that it's going to grow up to be the next Linux kernel or it's going to grow up to be the next WebKit or whatnot like that. But someone out there is going to look for a word to blah, blah, blah converter and be thrilled that it's sitting in an anonymous FTP directory somewhere. So this is a little thing that becomes... A, this is a snowflake that becomes a boulder rolling down a hill if everyone does it. So start thinking about things that when you're building them yourself, even if it's just an itch you have to scratch, even if it's a little script you wrote once to rename all the files in the directory to be lowercase or something like that, you know, something silly like that where it took you 10 minutes so that you didn't spend an hour doing it, put it out there and just make a note on a blog or something like that and go on with your life. Uh, one of the most interesting things I'd seen recently is who reads the website Reddit? R-E-D-D-I-T. It's a good site. It'll waste your whole day. I love it. Um, someone out there at one point said, you know, what are people working on that's interesting? You know, just, just an open source thing, whatever you got, just make a note, just a comment on this, this blog post. And uh, there were a lot of interesting things. It's like, this isn't nearly done, but I think it's cool. And it did bring me to something called ACK. Has anyone used this as a grep replacement? Oh, I have five minutes left. Okay, we're moving on. Uh, you know, you find these things by accident some days, and then you didn't know you needed it until you have it, like tabbed browsing, you know. Um, target foreign markets. I already said this before. Localization is really important. You cannot speak English in China. I mean, you could, but most people don't. Uh, if you're even in talking to an English-speaking Canada, if you go too far to one side, you're speaking French. Um, thank you, Quebec, for making that difficult for everyone. But... Um, <laughs> It is in your best interest as an open source developer to target non-English languages. In fact, I even get hate mail from people in Great Britain because, you know, I spell things with a Z where they should have an S or vice versa. So there's a site called launchpad.net. Who's a Ubuntu person? Let's hear it for Launchpad. Yeah. 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 Launchpad has a service called uh, a service translations.launchpad.net. I think I got that right. You put your open source project on there. You say, these are all the things I need translated. I tried this as an experiment with Mojo Setup, the installer. 24 hours later, I had 18 different translations to languages I have never heard of. I swear there's a Klingon version in there. <laughs> but even things where it's like, even if you're going to budget localization, it's a miserable job. No one wants to translate, even if they have the ability to. And you have that friend who speaks French, and he's annoyed at you after the third string you ask him to translate. And you didn't know that there's two kinds of Portuguese, for example. Um, it's important. Uh, so, but these markets are going to be important before America is. So even though you speak English, and English is the lingua franca of source code, you have to be thinking about other languages. Use UTF-8 whenever you need to encode a string, or use WHRT, whatever. Think about Unicode. If you're thinking about ASCII and you're thinking about US English, you will never think about anything but America. And at the minimum, you're going to lose money. At the minimum, you're not going to have a bigger enough ego because people in other countries aren't going to be able to use your stuff instead of worshiping you as the next Linus Torvalds. Uh, it's important. Think about foreign markets. That's the best way in the next 20 years is you're writing software to make Linux happen on the desktop, uh, whether you're a game writer or otherwise. But games also, doubly so. Um, target the lower end. The next computer you have is not going to look like that netbook, despite how tiny it is. It's going to look like this or, you know, whoever's cell phone. Who's bought a video game or a program at all for your cell phone? Raise your hand. It doesn't have to be an iPhone. It could be anything. It doesn't have to be Mac OS. It could be an Android phone, which runs Linux. Sooner or later, that's where all your software is going to come from, whether you buy it or download it. We're not going to use desktops. We don't use desktops now. Apple has reported, and I'm sure Dell will tell you the same thing, that more than 50% of their computers are no longer desktops. They are MacBooks. And I bet you if you wait five years, they're not going to say MacBook. They're going to say iPhone. 
So think about that. Do not target the high end. Think about the low end. The low end is where the smaller the computer you can run on and write something really nice, that's where your market's going to be. That's where your target audience is going to be. That's what you want to aim for. Don't use memory you don't have to. You have to be, you can't be lazy. This is the important thing. Aim for the smallest thing you can run on because the next day when you have to run on that Shiva plug and it doesn't have enough memory, you'll be ready for it. Um, I have a note here saying don't get stuck on unimportant stuff, but I've decided that's unimportant stuff, so I'm going to skip that. <laughs> and finally, and since this is meant to be a gaming talk, and my last note on here, and I have two minutes, is innovate, don't duplicate. Innovate. If you look at the games that we've talked about all these times, it's never the derivative. It's never the next aliens are coming at me and I see the barrel of my gun and I shoot as many of them as I can as I look for the red key to get to the exit. That game has been done for 20 years now. It's time to stop making that game. If you look at the games that people are going to talk about, it's going to be the braids. It's going to be the paths. It's going to be paths. Uh, if you haven't played that, it's a weird game. You should try it once and only once. Um, <laughs> we're going to start talking about things like games as art. But I, I mentioned Braid specifically because you look at this type of game and it does something no one's done before. It's done it in a 125 megabyte download when everyone else is downloading eight gigabyte games. You know, and it's realize that pretty graphics, although it's not an ugly game by any means, pretty graphics are not important. Gameplay was impor important. Pac-Man was a great game. It looks like crap. <laughs> but, but damn, if I didn't go into a pizza shop the other day and put a quarter in Ms. Pac-Man. Because it's, it's phenomenal. So as you're writing games, as you're writing software, if you're writing software and you're not writing games, stop writing stuff that looks like Windows. Write stuff that works better. That's why Apple is t eating your lunch right now instead of Microsoft. Write stuff that does something no one's done before but does it better. That's what you want to do. So don't spend any more time thinking about what other people are doing. Think about what you want to do. Think about what you want your computer to get done. Think about what you would like your friends and family and colleagues to be running. And this isn't about a holy war about Linux or BSD or Windows or you know whatever the next thing is that we're talking about. This is about you. This is about you and what you want your systems to look like and your experience to be. So. If I can give you one piece of advice, it's innovate. And don't worry about what the competition's doing. Anyway, I'm out of time. I got the 30 second thing. Any questions? I got 30 seconds. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I didn't realize there was an overflow room. <laughs> do, do I have time for questions, or are we done? Got a minute, got a okay, I got like a minute. If anyone has any questions, yes. Speaking of Reddit, I saw something on Reddit the other day about uh, someone finding shared object files in a uh, Steam release of the orange box. Yeah. Do you have anything to say about that? Yes, I do. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's, it's badly named Steam Client.so. You need parts of the client, but you don't get the client. Uh, it's just the way that Steam got architectured. I asked about it too. Everyone did. It's not a big deal. But hey, you never know what the future could bring. Next question. Go ahead. That's okay. We'll talk afterwards. Okay, go on. <laughs> what consoles do you play on? I have a PlayStation 2 and a Wii. Uh, I can't bring myself to give Microsoft money, so I never got an Xbox, and I can't for afford a PlayStation. When The Last Guardian comes out, I'll probably beg someone for a PlayStation 3 because it looks awesome. Yes? Can I borrow it? <laughs> Yes, sir. I don't think game distributions are important. I think if you're thinking about the distribution, it's the wrong level. Uh, you should be able to use whatever you want. There shouldn't be like, we can't install this because it's Debian. Who cares if it's Debian? We can target Slackware, and that doesn't look like anything. So, I mean. It's a waste of time. I mean, no one would buy Windows or Mac OS if it booted a game. I mean, you want to run on the systems that are there, unless you're going to ship a whole console, which would be awesome. But uh, I don't think you need a gaming distribution. I think it's a waste of time. Anyone else? I think I'm out of time here. Yes? Uh, let's go with probably could. I don't know. It's good luck to you with it, but I don't think I. There's a lot involved. It involves a lot of money, and it, I think consoles are the wrong way to go. I think that you have to talk about what people are using now, unless you have millions and millions of dollars and your name's Microsoft. Um, any questions? Anything else? Okay, I'll be around if anyone has any questions after this. So, okay, thank you. 
This work was recorded by View Digital Media and is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike version 3.0. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org.